Hi there, welcome to today's webinar, How to Protect Your DevOps Pipeline in a Post-SolarWinds World. I'm Kim Wines with Anchor, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Before we get into the content, I wanna just do a few housekeeping items. If we can move on to the next slide, Dan. Um, so your lines, as you've heard, are going to be muted during the webinar today, but we will be holding a question and answer at the end. So you can enter your questions on the questions panel on that go to webinar control panel. So if you go to questions at any point, you can add a question um, and we'll take them at the end. There may be some that we can respond to as we go through, but certainly we'll get to them at the end. Also, um, you will be receiving a follow-up email within the next 24 hours with a link to the recording from the webinar uh, so that you'll have access to that. And at the end of the webinar, as you're leaving, it'll prompt you for a quick feedback survey. It's just three quick questions. Would love it if you can fill that out and give us feedback so we can uh, better improve and enhance our future webinars as we go forward. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So for those of you that may not know Anchor, I'm just gonna give you the 10 second pitch here just so you know who we are in case you were forwarded this email from somebody else in your organization. So Anchor is focused on helping organizations to secure their cloud native software supply chain. So really about embedding security and compliance checks at every step in your software development process um, so that you can remediate more quickly, more easier and at a lower cost. And we do that with a continuous security and compliance platform that integrates um, seamlessly with all of the CI CD tool chain and DevOps tool chain that you already have in place. All right, so let's go on to the next slide here. Um, oh, let's go ahead and skip ahead from that. Um, let's go and do some polling questions. So we wanna get a sense of the audience here and you guys can get a sense of each other. So we'll do a few quick polls before we get started on the content. Um, so the first question that we have, let me launch the poll, is how closely your organization is following attacks like solar winds and more recently the code cove attack. Uh, so you can select here if your organization is following that very closely, somewhat closely, a little bit, not really following, or you're not sure. So go ahead and check the option that's most relevant to your company, and I'll give you a few seconds to get that checked. And let's go ahead. Got one more coming in. Perfect. I'm going to close the poll here and share the results with you. And just over a third of you are following it very closely and just under a third somewhat closely. Uh, some of you maybe just a little bit or not quite sure where you stand, but two thirds of you are, are paying attention or at least your organization is. Thank you for that. All right, so we're gonna do a second polling question. And the second polling question is, how is your organization changing their focus on software supply chain security in 2021. So based on maybe what's been going on, whether in the news or maybe other initiatives you've had in place for a while or previous attacks and breaches that have been in the news over the past few years, is that something that's causing your organization this year to increase your focus on this area or decrease or it's roughly about the same? I'm gonna give you a few seconds here so everybody has a moment to get their answers in. Still see some, some more people submitting their answers. All right, we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you. So over half of you um, are indicating it's significantly increased your focus on software supply chain security this year, and about a third increased somewhat, 15% uh, about the same, and then nobody uh, noticeably has decreased it. All right, we're gonna do one final polling question. And the final polling question is about what your what role your organization plays in the software supply chain. And you can pick more than one answer here. So if you're developing software that you're selling or shipping to customers, it might not be sold, it might be something you even give customers for free. 
um, or along with another product, uh, developing software that you use as SaaS, uh, if you're developing software for your own internal use, that you're, you're that role in the supply chain, if you're developing open source software, not using, but developing, or if you're just consuming software. Again, you can pick all that apply. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to get all your boxes checked and give you a moment to submit your answers here. And I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share the results with you. So uh, half of you have software that you're shipping to customers, half that you offer as SaaS, 57% internal use, and obviously this can overlap with some of these other ones. A, a fifth of you develop your own open source software, and then of course uh, most people are consuming software as well. Great, that will be helpful as we go through because we're going to be talking about um, the different uh, positions and roles within the supply chain. All right, so with that, let's go on to one next slide here. I just want to introduce our speakers for today. Um, so our first speaker for today is going to be Daniel Nermi, who's a CTO and co-founder at Ancor. And then uh, once Dan speaks, we'll hear from Paul Nova Reese, a senior solutions architect at Ancor. So with that, Dan, if you want to join us, and I'll turn it over to you. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Kim. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar today. Um, very happy to, to, to have you and um, uh, taking some time to, to have a discussion about software supply chain security, right? So today, you know, there's there's been an awful lot of uh, sort of public security incidents, a lot of uh, discussion in the security industry around supply chain attacks that have happened and, and various types of supply chain security topics. And what we really wanted to dig into a little bit is like to have this discussion about what, what really does this mean? What's going on with software supply chains? Why are attackers using this methodology uh, to, to, to get attacks to actually happen and create these very public incidents um, uh, that, that, that have been very public and very important, uh, serious security problems, uh, in particular over the last six months? So we've seen a lot of these headlines, right? The, the Solar Winds incident, more recently, there was a code cove situation that happened. And attached to all of these incidents, we see this phrase supply chain uh, happening. And in addition, a lot of the other verbiage and, and sort of industry, security industry attention has really been put on, you know, why are these things happening? Is this new? Is this something that's particularly important? And we wanted to do a, a bit of a coverage here to try to figure out a little bit more detail about what supply chain security really means and also, uh, you know, after that discussion, we'll move into some practical um, uh, suggestions about what you can do in order to mitigate some of these attacks and, and make sure that your uh, organization is, is protected. So if we start at this typical kind of iceberg view, it really does kind of apply here. Up at the top, we're, we're seeing a lot of news articles, a lot of security um, coverage that's really based around these particular incidents. But if we actually look at from the attacker's perspective or those of us who are software suppliers or consumers of software, really, we're really more interested on what's really going on underneath you know, those, those, uh, those sort of top level situations. And this is where the risk comes in. And, and this is kind of what we're gonna talk about here. A lot of software that's actually out there being exploited as a consequence of these security incidents um, has its their origins somewhere else uh, in a different organization or earlier on in the supply chain where software dependencies and open source software and a lot of different complicated uh, elements are all being combined together. And that's what the attackers are really looking for. And so this, this whole picture kind of starts with a couple of different perspectives. Okay? We just had a poll um, where the answers kind of ranged from we're developing our own software for customers or it's for internal use we're also software consumers. A lot of us have different roles, but it's kind of interesting to look at the software supply chain story from the different perspectives. So if we're a software consumer, whether we're consuming the software internally or it's an application or a website running on, on the public internet, we have a particular view of, we know what 
suppliers, what software we're bringing in and combining to in order to offer our application. Right? As a software consumer, we've got some production system that's running. We know what's coming in. We might have some idea of what's earlier in the chain, but we definitely have this information. Now, from a software supplier's perspective, we know who's consuming our software oftentimes. We also know that we ourselves are consumers of software in order to combine that information into our software that we're then providing to the consumer. And so we have this more expansive view where we know as, as suppliers, we have our own suppliers and open source tools and they have their own suppliers and open source tools and, and so on. We don't really have global visibility because we don't know what our consumers, other suppliers might be, but we definitely have a bit more of a comprehensive, like easily accessible view of this situation. But now if we scoot way back and say, what's the global view? If you, if you look at this situation globally, the picture starts to look like this. And this is actually even kind of an oversimplification. Right? There's no way we can fit for a, a modern, sufficiently complex production application, say running at internet scale, what this graph looks like that would fit on a single slide. But the point is, it's very, uh, it's very complicated. There are a lot of different elements and there are dependencies between them. There are links where all of this software is flowing into ultimately what's running in production. And the reason to kind of look at the software supply chain from this perspective is this is what a malicious actor or an attacker will see as an opportunity. Right? When, when, a, when a malicious actor looks at this, they think to themselves, or the plan is, we ultimately want to expose the consumer, because that's where the software is actually running, to, a, you know, to, a, to a, um, uh, uh, an exposure so that we can exploit it. And in order to do that, there's so many elements here, all we need to do is compromise one of them. If we can get our malicious code into any one of these elements, we know it's gonna flow in all the way through this graph or this chain and ultimately expose the consumer. This is kind of an interesting approach and it's, it's a, you know, an attack methodology uh, that, that malicious actors will use. And there's some interesting nuance to it in that oftentimes, uh, and especially for some of these, these, uh, these more public uh, incidents that we've seen recently, the software supplier themselves, although that's where the malicious actor actually went in and created the, problem, the root of the problem, the, the actual attack doesn't compromise the software supplier. They're not impacted directly. And that's to the attacker's benefit to make sure that they're getting the problem inserted at that point in the supply chain, but they try to keep it very much under wraps because their actual exposure they're looking to take, to take advantage of is way over in the consumer side. So we're going to take a look at, okay, if, if we're a software supplier and all of the software suppliers uh, start to pay a lot more attention, don't want to be the, the organization that is, is mentioned uh, in, in the security incident or is the core of the, the problem that happens for a major security incident, what can we do as a software supplier? And this all kind of goes to a view of the software supplier DevOps tool chain. Oftentimes today with a, with a modern system as a, as a software generator or a supplier, we have you know, generally something that looks like this, where on the left-hand side, we have our application source code. This is the stuff that we're experts in. We're developing an application. On the right-hand side, we have that application is built, it's executable, it's signed, it's released, it's ready for the customer uh, or, or consumer to, to, uh, to actually deploy. And in between, there are a number of steps. This whole process these days is becoming much more and more automated. So every time there's a new feature, a bug fix, or a security uh, update from your development team, this mechanism kicks off and these different stages get executed, ultimately resulting in the consumer facing uh, you know, a piece of software. There's both the workload, that's the application and all of the executable artifacts, your containers, container images, things like that get built along this, this uh, the spectrum, and there's the platforms that are actually supporting this entire mechanism. These are the things like your source code management system, your CI, CD, automated test tools, and the, the publication mechanisms. And again, if we look at this, we, we oftentimes think of that this is our functional system that gives value to our customers and our own processes. But when an attacker looks at this, they see 
once again, there's a lot of different elements. Identifying a weakness in any one of these elements allows an attack to take place. And so an attacker's view is something like this. We can introduce uh, our uh, vulnerability that will ultimately expose a consumer all the way at the source. Anytime in the source code management system, there's different things you can do, and we'll talk a little bit more, uh, more about those in a second. Your CI CD system, if that's compromised, you can, you can uh, you know, execute an attack that way, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of different places here that the attacker will look at and see as opportunities for, for getting um, you know, malicious code in place. And so how do containers actually relate to this? Well, if we look at, you know, more and more we're seeing organizations actually running or relying on containers to facilitate that automated from source code to publication process, uh, whether it's internal or, or customer facing, because containers really do provide a very easy and compelling way to package and deliver your application code. They encapsulate an entire execution environment, configurations, sometimes supporting operating system packages. They, they really can encapsulate a very portable uh, unit that is easy for customers to consume or production systems to consume. It's very trackable. Um, it, it, it removes some of the complexities of having general uh, configurations and just putting the software that your application needs really close to the application. So a lot of good reasons to use containers as a, a mechanism to support that automated deployment in your DevOps tool chain. But once again, whenever we see a lot of elements in a picture like this, that's when an attacker can see anyone, you know, compromising any one of these can, can be something that, that will uh, allow for a successful attack. And importantly, from, an, from a supplier's perspective, we're experts in our application code. We might not be experts in all of the other things that can be within a container image in support of that application code. And so we have to pay, pay special attention to those things when, when using containers for this. And so finally, before we move into some of the, the practical uh, examples and discussion of how we can help to, to mitigate and enforce security uh, in this area, we thought it'd be good to just go over some of the container exposures or the common exposures that we see right, that are, that are part of some of these supply chain attacks, specifically targeted at software suppliers. The first category is something that's, that's pretty, pretty well understood, um, and it's around soft, known software vulnerabilities, right? We look at that container picture, and we see our application is, has its, is itself software, but it oftentimes will have a lot of dependencies from open source or from other suppliers. Those are all dependencies that must be evaluated for vulnerabilities. And oftentimes in a container image, there's also a, a, an operating system that's underlying the whole environment that has its own software in it. And attackers can sort of Im impact or if they can find you know, what software is in there and that perhaps we're not keeping all of that up to date, they can exploit the fact that there's known vulnerabilities. So that's definitely something we need to check for. The second category is really around malware and Trojan horses. This is another vector that an attacker might use somewhere in your CI CD or the, the DevOps tool chain where attackers will come in and if they can find a weakness, they can inject malicious code into existing application or other kind of binaries in the container image, or also maybe even replace uh, executables with something that works the same way as the executable that's supposed to be there but also contains malicious code. These are also a whole category of, of um, uh, attacks that we need to look for that can exist inside of your container image that you might be uh, you know, publishing. The third category is a little bit more subtle. It's around software overrides. Related in a sense to malware, but there's a different sort of category and, and vector of how software overrides can, can make their way into your DevOps uh, tool chain as a supplier. And these things typically happen somewhere between when you have your source code and that source code is being combined together into something executable. One of the kind of typical examples is something called typo squatting, and that's taking advantage of potential human error. It's a clever attack where you know, somebody might say, well, in, in my application, I have to write down what my dependencies are, maybe on my keyboard, and assume perhaps I make a typo, I misspell the word PostgreSQL. 
uh, with replacing the Q and the L in, in their order, an attacker might actually publish a malicious version of PostgreSQL with the letters intentionally replaced. And when it comes to building that, we'll pull in the attacker's version rather than the version that was intended. The final category is actually around credentials. And this is another interesting area where it might not be a direct uh, attack, but oftentimes we see organizations sometimes including credentials or temporary keys or maybe even production keys as part of their development process. In, in, in order to test the software, you might need temporary access to something and it's just easier to put the credentials right next to the application or hard coded in source or maybe even have like a mechanism for pulling the credentials in the container. And if we're not careful, those credentials can unintentionally make their way into the release artifacts. And attackers are constantly looking at those public release artifacts and trying to see if there's credentials. And if there are, they can take the credentials and use them to, you know, uh, to do other types of attacks and exposures in these other categories. So these are just uh, some of the examples of things that can happen. And now we're, I think uh, we'll, we'll kind of switch gears and move over to now that we know what they are, uh, what can we do to try to protect ourselves as software suppliers um, if these things happen or even prevent them from happening in the first place? So with that, I think I'm oh. going to pass it over to Paul. Great. Thanks, Dan. We'll switch uh, screens here. Give us one moment. Okay. I think I've got it up. Um, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Uh, it was really good. Uh, background on the, the concepts here. So now we'll we'll jump into some of the actual practical applications. How do we take this knowledge we have and, and put it into practice, right? So before we look at the actual policies, I want to just show real quick a uh, review of how Anchor scans and evaluates container images, right? So we'll talk a lot about the software bill of materials. When we see an image the first time, we're going to open it up and catalog everything that's in the image and build this software bill of materials. This is what, when you look at an image analysis in, in this case, the web UI, but uh, you know, you might do this automatically through the API as well. You'll see these, these um, tabs essentially, right? Metadata, the contents, this is the software bill of materials, what's in the image, just the facts of the image, right? So we wanna know everything there is to know about this image and store it in our catalog so we can refer to it later, right? So that can be the contents, what packages are installed. And again, this is just a pretty common Nginx container uh, image. You know, it has some Alpine packages in it. It also has a bunch of files, right? There is a file system inside this container. We want to know what those files are, what permit, you know, the metadata of these files, permissions, checksums, et cetera, uh, language artifacts as well, if there are any, all the way down to individual, you know, layer by layer, how is this image put together, right? And once we store all that in our catalog, we can go and do evaluations very rapidly and continuously. And the evaluations will be things like, what does this, now that we know what's in the image, what do we know about it in practice, right? So today it can be things like what vulnerabilities are in this image. And again, this is pretty factual here, right? This is just a readout of what we know, given the software bill of materials, what vulnerabilities do we know about in here and where are they coming from? And also things like a judgmental view, right? We know what's in there. We know how it was put together do we want to allow this to continue or not, right? So this will be, we build a bunch of rules and then evaluate the image and does it comply with our rules? Okay, so I'm gonna refer back to um, Dan's slide here as we look at some actual policies to convert these concepts into gates that we can decide whether images comply or not, right? So we'll look at those. So first of all, vulnerability checks, right? Again, we have a view of vulnerabilities. We can do things like just say, look at the severity of the vulnerabilities and use that as a, as a guide as to whether we'll allow an image to proceed or not, right? In this case, I'm just gonna say something very simple, like if the severity is greater than or equal to critical, then I will have these actions over here when a rule is triggered. In this case, we will stop the image. But we could do other things too, right? There's a lot of knobs you can turn on vulnerabilities things like the CVSS scores, things like if a fix is available or not, 
uh, how long it's been since advisories have been created or how long since the, the fixes have been published and so on, right? Um, this is pretty you know, much table stakes. A, a lot of, of uh, products out there will do this kind of checking. Um, going back here, as we move in from vulnerabilities to more malicious software, explicitly malicious code, right? A couple of things we can do to check for that. Um, first of all, just a, a, a standard malware scanner, right? So we can we can integrate with something like ClamAV and just do a malware scan on an image. And if we find something, we'll stop the image, right? Or we can get a little more specific and look at things like um, not only Trojan horses, but the things that attackers will bring in once they're in, right? So in this case, a crypto miner, right? Crypto miners have a lot of very common uh, signatures, fingerprints they leave, right? And we can detect those things like um, how they name their files, even down to the checksums of the actual binaries, right? Things that are harder to disguise. Most of these, once they're bringing them in, they're just using standard toolkits. So it's very easy to find these fingerprints. We can just catalog them and build a lot of policies. And the more things we know about them, the more policy rules we can build, the better the chances are that we'll catch these things, right? So you can see there's a ton of, of fingerprints here that we know about. And that wouldn't be limited to just crypto miners, but pretty much any malicious code, we can build those kind of rules. Um, going back to software overrides, as Dan mentioned, there's a couple of different subcategories in this in this uh, area, right? We'll start with things like uh, typo squatting. So first of all, image typo squatting, right? I want Nginx, but I type Engine Z. A couple of things you can do to guard against this. One, you can just block things like Docker Hub or, or public image re registries, right? I don't want to single out Docker Hub here, but any public image registry and just force users to use an internal registry. And then you can have processes for bringing outside content in there that's vetted. But the main point is when you do this um, and use, in this case, an internal harbor.example.com, right? The main thing is attackers can't push arbitrary images into this registry, right? So if I did slip up and type engine Z, I wouldn't pull a malicious image, I would just get an image failure. So what we're doing here is basically vetting the Docker file itself, looking at the from instruction for the definition of the base image, right? And saying, if it's Docker Hub, we're gonna stop it. If it's, and then we're gonna say, if it's not our internal registry, we'll stop it. Pretty straightforward. And again, I wanna make sure everybody's understanding, like a lot of these rules are going to have various levels of, of strictness, right? Not all of these rules will be suitable for everyone, but we can definitely talk about what the, the appropriate um, rules are for your, your personal situation, right? Your risk tolerance and, and project sensitivity. Um, continuing on in the typo squatting vein, package typo squatting, as, as, as Dan mentioned, is, is becoming a little more popular. A lot of um, languages are developing hardened uh, package management, right? So in the case of Python, PIP is pretty notorious for having these kind of, you know, attacks against uh, the, the public Python repos. Um, there's something called PIPsec now that will attempt to kind of stamp out typo squatting, among other things, right? So we can en enforce a policy that says you have to install PIPsec if you're using PIP, right? And if somebody doesn't do that, then we'll block the image. Um, but in the more general sense of dependency confusion, right, where we're not talking about typos now, we're talking about someone basically fooling us into pulling it from registry X, you know, malicious registry instead of um, trusted registry. Just like we did with the, whoops, with the uh, image repositories, we can do things like enforce uh, through the use of this index URL option for PIP. And again, this is, I'm showing Python, but we can do similar things with Node or Ruby or whatnot. Um, in this case, we're going to do things like block the public repository and use an internal repository, right? And this can be two rules, it could be one rule. Um, other things though, like this extra index URL option, right? That gives um, a developer the ability to say multiple registries and then depending on what order they're in, you might actually pull something that you didn't intend to. Um, we can block stuff like that and just make sure they're only using the vetted repositories. 
Um, now these are Docker file instruction checks, right? So we're looking at the actual building of the image. There's also configuration files that can define these repositories where they would be. We can use the uh, Anchor secret scan feature, which is really intended to find uh, things like uh, credentials, which we'll talk about in just a second. But we can also use that to look at configuration files. And since we're just defining arbitrary regular expressions here, we could define an extra index URL for Python um, and catch stuff like that in configuration files. We'll come back to this in just a second. Um, let's see, uh, back to the slide here. Um, I think that's most of those, but yeah, like I said, credentials, that's a good segue. Um, we'll just jump right back to that, that policy, whoops. So Anchor does have the secret scanner, as I mentioned, um, but all we're looking for is arbitrary regular expressions. We provide a bunch out of the box, right? AWS access keys, AWS secret keys, private SSH keys, et cetera, right? Um, again, these are out of the box, but you can add your own if you wanted to find other things as well. But I've just got a bunch of policies set up here, a bunch of rules. If I see any of this stuff, um, you know, somebody is doing, leaving things in files rather than using a secret management tool like Vault or Kubernetes secrets or Docker secrets, right? Uh, the CodeCov um, uh, incident was basically focused around this kind of, of problem where there are just credentials lying around in images. Um, so we can, we can catch that, you know, provide the feedback to the developer. Hey, you know, usually this is an accidental thing but we want to catch it. Uh, a few other things just to round it out. Um, there's a few other things like data transfer, right? We probably want to ensure, enforce that developers are using the code in their own repositories where the Docker files are, and they're not just like grabbing chunks of code from random GitHub repos, right? So we can look at the Docker file and if they're doing uh, anything like pulling stuff down. And again, these are just regular expressions. We can modify these all we want. Um, we can flag these kind of operations, whether they're in an add instruction, a copy, a run, whatnot, right? So we're actually looking at the individual uh, Docker file here. Uh, I think we covered most of these. Let's see, yep, 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 yep. One other thing, oh, of course, the malware scanner. We mentioned crypto miners. I think I mentioned that. Yeah, we do integrate with CranRAV. I did mention that, sorry. So what does this look like when we actually run an image through and catch these kind of things, right? So if we go back to the image analysis, in this case, um, an image that I've constructed for this, uh, we can see, oh, this image has failed. Well, why has it failed? We just get a readout of these indiv every individual rule that was violated. Right, and how bad the violation was. So in this case, ClamAV found the crypto miner, right? A um, couple of signatures there. Our secret scanner found those extra index URL um, options in a couple of Python configuration files. Um, our secret scanner found an AWS access key. We found an SSH private key, right? So all of this feedback one by one um, here's one where we didn't use the internal image registry for a base image, right? Actually, we got two of those violations because this is a multi-stage build, and I pulled two different images from Docker Hub. Uh, we caught each of them. Um, a vulnerability that we caught, it's so on and so forth, right? You get the idea. Here's one we didn't use pipsec when I installed uh, some Python package, um, and an, a crypto miner signature. Um, so all of this feedback, you know, is, is useful to the developer that gives them the, the roadmap for how to get their image into compliance, right? But some developers probably don't want to, you know, have an extra account in Anchor and log into one other web UI to see this stuff. We can push it straight to them through whatever DevOps tool, whatever CI CD pipeline you're using. In this case, it's Jenkins, right? It's very simple to do this with any CI CD tooling since our API is open. Um, in this case, I built an image, I pushed it to a scratch repo, and then in my Jenkins file, I just called the Anchor Analyzer, right? And in this case, we got a stop, right? It broke the pipeline right here. And if we want to see what actually happened, um, I can look at the logs and see right here, this, for, 
you can see where it submits the image for analysis and it gets the result back from the um, from the policy engine of a failure, right? And now we're wondering, well, what failed, right? So we push that uh, feedback to the developer as well. Um, let me just go and show the actual build. All of that stuff we just saw in the web UI is here in JSON format. Our plugin will turn that into a human readable report. So in this case, you can see we've got 12 different violations uh, that caused a final action of stop. Um, and again, each one of those violations is enumerated here one by one so the developer can see what rules were violated and know what needs to be done to fix them, right? This is the exact same stuff we saw in the web UI. Okay, so going back to, um, you know, so that's a lot, right? Uh, how do we, you know, maybe there's a couple of takeaways we can have here. What best practices, you know, what are the quick wins? How do I operationalize this and get some, some benefit today, right? Four major points, I'll break these down a little bit for you as well. Use CICD processes for everything. And not just the software you're developing, you can use this for software you're, you're consuming as well, right? When I bring in something from outside, whether it be um, an Alpine base image or an Nginx package or, you know, Postgres, I want to send everything through the same process, ensure that all of those components are getting the same treatment, the same scrutiny. Um, two, build from trusted sources. As we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, have your internal repositories uh, that have the vetted um, source components. Uh, three, automate all of this, right? The more automation you have, the less likely something auto accidentally gets sidestepped. Right. If you automate the entire process, it becomes very, you almost have to be trying to violate um, the policy by ignoring it. Right. And then for enforce it at production. Right. So if somebody does accidentally sidestep some of the policy, let's make sure that that we stop that before um, the developed, you know, whatever the whether it's an image or some other component gets into production. So just to begin here, uh, point one, how do we uh, you know, secure the CICD pipeline? One, like I said, use a centralized pipeline, make sure everything goes through it. Two, implement this least privilege, just like you would for anything else, right? That concept of least privilege is pretty important. There's multiple stages in your pipeline. Each stage probably has different needs. There's no reason to give all of the privileges needed to every stage. Uh, so you can lock those down. Um, three, granting access to trusted external systems. So this could be, you know, your CI/CD pipeline should only trust specific code repositories, should only trust specific binary repositories um, and specific um, image registries. And finally, you know, document everything as much as you can, right? So the, the Anchor uh, analyzer will add a bunch of metadata to the software bill of materials. Uh, things like when the image was detected, when the last time it was evaluated, things like that. Um, you can add additional metadata. Um, that can help a lot with investigations just to make sure who has, you know, signed off on these things and stuff like that, right? Uh, next, going to, you know, how do we ensure we're building from trusted sources? So first thing, minimal base images, right? The, the smaller the base image, the better. The less stuff that is in the image, the fewer potential vulnerabilities you have, right? Smaller code is, is in general, going to have fewer vulnerabilities, all, all other things being equal. Um, so start with the smallest thing you can and only add what you need. Um, two, again, only pull from, you know, approved repositories, right? Don't just blindly trust, you know, Joe's image shack or whatnot on the internet. Uh, three, Docker file, uh, when you write your Docker files, there are best practices for that. And again, as you saw in, when we looked at the policy rules, we can help enforce those best practices. We can build rules a, a, around how those Docker files are laid out, how the images are being put together. And finally, this, the software bill of materials, right? Once you have that, you've got basically an inventory control, right? You know what you had at what time, you can use it to kind of look at changes over time as well. Um, so obviously every time you push an image through Anchor, 
you generate one of these. Automation, what can we do here to help out? First of all, incorporate security checks at every stage of the pipeline, right? So once we scan the image and we build that software bill of materials, we can evaluate it as often as we want. And the evaluation is a very rapid process. So doing it very frequently doesn't necessarily slow the pipeline down. Um, the evaluations are really lightweight and it helps you see if something has changed since the first time the image was scanned, right? Have new vulnerability definitions come in, right? The more frequently you're doing these checks, uh, the more likely you are to catch something earlier in the process rather than later. And if you catch it early, it's easier to fix. It doesn't take as long, it's cheaper. You developer, it's fresher in their mind. Um, next, inspecting the entire artifacts, right? Not just doing a CVE scan. As I mentioned, the CVE scans are pretty much table stakes today. Uh, there's a lot more in the image than just getting a list of CVEs. Uh, a lot of things that are not, you know, strictly considered a vulnerability can still impact the security of your image. Uh, next, tracking the diffs, right? So what's going on in this image over time, right? As we improve the software, you know, is the security of this image also improving? Um, when, if there is an incident, we have the ability to go back in time and see, you know, what was introduced when, right? So we've got that, that forensic ability as well. And finally, um, having a vulnerability management process, right? And the platform layer, the base image layer, the application layer, we're tracking everything. We have software bills of material. We can see all the associated vulnerabilities at each, um, at each stage. Um, lastly, deploying only trusted images, right? So first of all, as we mentioned, if we're automating everything, everything is going through this CICD process. We know everything is getting a software bill of materials. We wanna check and only deploy um, stuff that has gone through that process, right? So Anchor offers uh, a Kubernetes admission controller, which is one way to do that, right? Right before we create containers, we can do a final check and make sure, A, does this image still pass? But more importantly, did we already know about this image? Have we seen it before? If we haven't seen it, and it's all of a sudden showing up at production, something's gone off the rails. We better, you know, slam the brakes on and stop this image from being turned into running containers. Um, so that gives you a one last check against, you know, to make sure all of your other processes are working properly. Um, next, deploying using digest instead of tags, right? So tags, you can reuse tags, right? Uh, an image, especially things like latest, you know, um, it's hard to be sure what version of the image you'll actually be pulling. If you use digest, digests are immutable. Right? The digest cannot be reused. Anytime you change something in the image, the digest will change. Now, it's very difficult to use digest at scale unless you are automating everything, right? And you can track images by digest, which if you have a software bill of materials, those are tied to digests. You can see what digests are known, which ones are unknown, and uh, you can deploy that way. Um, Inspecting, you know, the application as well as um, not just the application, but also the, the deployment, the configuration, right? So uh, as we showed, um, we can look at the, the Docker file, right? How is the image configured, right? Not only what's in it, but how are we putting it together? Also things like Helm charts, right? When you deploy using a Helm chart, there's a lot of information, a lot of metadata in that Helm chart about what Kubernetes objects will be created, um, you know, what dependencies are there, things like that. Um, and then finally, enforcing policy both before and after deployment. Uh, and what we mean by that is, you know, we're, we're scanning and evaluating images as they come out of the build process, but we're also doing that evaluation uh, when we deploy and keeping track of those images, what's running in which environment, right? So let's say a zero day vulnerability is disclosed. We wanna know what our exposure is, right? If we have, um, inventory of which images are being used in which environments. We can figure out very quickly where, where we're vulnerable um, you know, to a newly disclosed vulnerability. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I, I wanna turn it back over to either Dan or Kim at this point and move into the question and answer phase.
Yeah, Dan, is there anything else you want to add before we go on to the questions and answers? Uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I think that was a, a really great overview of some some great steps. And you know, that that last view is really about you know, as software suppliers, we just want to make sure we're doing everything we can um, to to mitigate these attacks. And and if we do, then yeah, uh, then you know, we we improve the software supply chain's um, story substantially. So you know, really appreciate that overview. All right, great. We've had a couple of questions come in, um, but feel free to enter any additional questions in the questions panel, and we'll try to take as many of those as we can. Um, so the first question is whether there's any recommendation about which stage or stages in the DevOps process that you should be focused on you know, with these security controls. Is it is it just at the CI CD stage? You showed that Jenkins example, Paul, or are there other phases that people should be focused on as well? Yeah, well, the first answer is yes, all of them, right? Uh, th the good thing about the way we scan images, when we build that software bill of materials, the first time we see it. So as soon as it comes out of the build pipeline and you have an actual image, we scan it immediately. And then, like I said, once that's done, we can evaluate it very quickly at every stage, right? We want to continuously evaluate it to see if something does change, right? Maybe the policy rules change, um, but more commonly it will be something like vulnerability definitions get updated. We want to know as soon as that happens that an image that we thought was passing is now failing, right? So there's no reason, it's a very small cost to continuously evaluate that image, especially once you split the, the scanning into the, you know, building the software bill of materials is one, one phase that only has to be done one time. Right. Since we're tracking the images by digest, we only have to scan it that one time and then the, the very lightweight evaluation happens as many times as we want. So every time you promote an image from, you know, the dev environment to the QA environment or from the QA environment to the staging environment or right before you deploy it into production, you know, any any point in between that. Right. Every time new definitions come in, we can reevaluate the images. Right. So, yes. Uh, I would always recommend that we do it as frequently, as often as possible, right? So scan early and evaluate always. And how does that extend to the runtime environment? What would that look like? So at runtime, there's two things. One, um, the admission controller, as I mentioned, will let you, A, ensure that a scan has been done before it goes into production, right? And that it's still evaluating with a pass. Uh, we also have a, a Kubernetes, um, automated inventory agent that will monitor your, whichever clusters or namespaces you want. Um, generally, it will be like a production thing, right? We'll monitor the production namespaces and keep track of which particular images are actually being used in that environment, right? So then when we need a report of, A, like what is running, right? It's hard to tell sometimes, right? Which version of this, uh, you know, software package are we actually running in production? We can generate that or, you know, like I said, more importantly, when there's a critical situation where, you know, a new um, vulnerability has been disclosed and we already have something out there in the wild that we didn't catch because nobody knew about it, right? We can see instantly what our exposure is because we know exactly which images are running in which environments. So we can instantly generate a report to say, you have, you know, this new CV in these namespaces on from these images right and then we know exactly what we need to do to remediate that problem so the whole so the whole fire drill whenever there's some big new vulnerability that gets announced becomes much easier to really pinpoint what you need to worry about that's that's great exactly all right so yeah <laughs> uh the other question was really about kind of who would be the roles in this process. So you had showed, for example, policies, Paul, and you'd shown also Jenkins. So who would be setting up the policies? Are developers going to be using that UI or what are developers going to see in this world? So in, it's going to vary. Dan, you want to take that one? I can take that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we're, we're probably in sync on this, but you know, it, it, it definitely varies uh, across uh, the, the organization, but there are very distinct personas, and you know, systems like Anchor take that that different persona view into account. Right? Uh, definitely on the developer side, you know, it's it's all about 
what, what are the actionable items that a developer can actually act upon? In the DevOps side, it might be the same vulnerability, but a different response, right, uh, in order to, to actually fix the problem. And then there's sort of the security or security ops side, which might not have as much visibility into digests and source code lines and things like that, but they might be very, very much concerned on the high level concepts of, you know, whether or not a vulnerability exists with a fix or not might actually change the risk assessment. And so that needs to be encoded somewhere, right? So the different elements of a situation like this have to be taken into account. And that's what we strive to do with, with Anchor. Policies are set up for a security team to go in and be able to articulate the organization's security requirements in a, in a fairly generalized form. But at the same time, those policies can be consumed and understood by the DevOps team in order for the result of a policy evaluation to be actionable for them and give them enough information to then go back to the developers to take action with the context that's that's most important to the developers. So the whole chain, you know, we, we strive to make um, all of that information available to those who need to interact with it. And so like for a developer, you're saying they can often get that information right within their tools they're already using. Like, I think we saw that example with Jenkins. They didn't have to go to some UI. They were able to get it right there. Or I assume like Slack or other channels or Jira tickets or things like that. Exactly. Right. And and uh, the Anchor technology uh, works that way in that it's a, it's a system that's set up with APIs that can be interacted with and integrated with the various platforms very easily. Uh, and we also have custom integrations with the various tools to to expose the information in the right way for that tool. All right, I have another question. Uh, we had at the, one of the beginning slides where you had the iceberg, you showed CodeCub. And um, this person mentions that there was some info that the tech was around a Docker image potentially that was compromised. And whether there's any further information on the attack vector, specifically in the CodeCub example. Some of those details are still emerging, uh, but what we do know is that it was a it was a credential type of situation where either there was a credential or there was a mechanism for accessing a credential that was essentially accidentally uh, you know, left there, and attackers were able to exploit that exposure in order to get more access uh, in the customer environment. We don't have all the details quite yet. All right. Well, I think that's it for the questions. So thanks everybody for joining for today's webinar. And we hope to see you on a future webinar. And thanks Paul and Dan for enlightening us all. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.